Hello, everyone. I am Amanda Washington. I am the National New Play Network producer in residency at Actors Express. I am a short African American woman. I have on a pinkish gold head wrap with some really cat eye glasses. And I have on a black shirt with a pearl necklace. That's me in a virtual box for you. Welcome to Raising the Curtain, conversations led by Actors Express. And so Raising the Curtain is essentially <clears throat> Actors Express reminding us of the promises we made a year ago and how we plan to continue perpetuating those promises and actually putting word action to word as we go back to in-person theater. And so tonight for our final conversation, I know it's kind of bittersweet, it's whose story is it? And essentially is who has the right to tell stories and do stories only belong to one group of people or do they belong to a multitude of people to tell? And so tonight I will let our panelists introduce who they are starting with India. Hi, my name is India Nicole Burton and I'm the Artistic Associate at Cleveland Public Theater. I'm coming to you from the stolen land of the Erie people. Uh, I use the pronouns she, her, hers, and I am a former National New Play Network producer in residence. Um, so, yeah, and I have purple hair and I have on a black hat and that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> Uh, hey, y'all, I'm Lavina Jadwani, uh, she, her, hers. I'm calling in from the unceded lands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi, colonially known as Chicago. Um, I'm a, I don't know, medium height, medium skin South Asian woman, black hair and a ponytail, and uh, some pink blue light glasses and a red lip courtesy of Mac for today. Uh, the lenses I bring to, to the work, I'm a, a, an alum of the National Directors Fellowship through uh, the National Play Network, lots of NNPN fans here also just joined the, the board uh, with Freddie. Um, but yeah, for today's conversation, the, the lenses I bring to the work, I'm a director, I'm adapter, educator, and activist. Hi, I'm Freddie Ashley. I'm the artistic director here at Actors Express. I uh, use he, him, his, um, and uh, I am here in Atlanta, which is also the uh, lands of the Muscogee and Creek people. And um, I have on a yellow shirt with a collar and tortoise shell rim glasses, and I'm a um, white dude with a double chin. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's get started with this conversation. First question. So with in-person theater reopening, what expectations are you holding the industry to? Specifically stories that are being produced on the stage or just stories that are given focus to with these theaters? Well, I can jump in if that's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, over the pandemic, there seems to be a, a large interest in people of color stories and uh, predominantly white institutions um, wanting to tell those stories. So I'm hoping that, you know, they can we, they continue to uh, champion those stories. Um, and it's not just a fad or a trend or anything like that. And um, that the theaters continue to invite and, and give their spaces, not allow, but give their spaces to uh, marginalized people of colors so that we can, um, so that we can hear different, you know, different stories of marginalized individuals. Um, for, for me, I think, you know, as we're, as we're coming back, it's interesting. I, I, I think the two things I want from, from theater is for it to be inclusive and for it to be urgent. Um, and I still think there's a lot of, you know, that leaves a lot of territory. Um, I will say, um, you know, going off of what India was, was saying and Amanda, your question, um, you know, before the pandemic, I was, um, I spent a fair amount of time as a casting director and an artistic director, though I wear neither of those hats right now. Um, but it meant that I, I got invited to see a lot of plays and 
And so, I don't know, coming out of grad school, which is five or six years ago at this point, um, I, I, I started saying, um, I live in Chicago. We have like, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a theater company here, right? We've got like 300 plus. And, and yet I started saying, I'm not going to your theater unless there is at least one playwright and one director of color in your season. Um, and that's for me coming as a, um, as a former casting director, you know, I, I was finding that like, look, casting was getting a lot of energy certainly before the pandemic but for me that felt like that was sort of the band-aid and like the root you know the the root disease is systemic racism um so for me you know I, and i know that there's been a lot while we've had these times to to reconsider how we do things reconsider what equity means um and yeah i think for me i'm I, I so appreciate this question because yeah, for me, I think, for me, it isn't actually so much that my values have changed. It's that my standards are, are higher because of the time we've had off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Higher standards. Can I ask you to explain a little bit more of what you mean about urgent? I haven't, yeah. I don't think I've heard it. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think, again, as a director, right, I think I have to walk into into design meetings and to rehearsals with a solid answer to the question of why this play now. Um, and I and I learned the hard way in my early career that like, and this is me, I'm a person with an opinion. But I think earlier in my career, I thought, oh, if I don't have that immediately, I will I will find it. And for me as an artist now, I'm like, no, I need to I need to know that answer before I sign on board. Mm -hmm. And that's me, I'm a person with an opinion but I, I think as an audience member what i mean by urgent right like look i'm still i went to these folks know i went to pick up my dog before this she's she's been groomed she's lovely but like i i'm still sort of wanting to be at the front of the middle of things coming back you know i identify as immunocompromised as do members of my family so like if you're gonna ask me to risk my life just a little bit to walk into the theater i i think i think that for me there has to be a good answer to like why this story? Why now? Because mm -hmm. otherwise, television is incredible right now. <laughs> <laughs> that is very well said. <laughs> yeah, that is. I, and look, I, I agree with everything that India and Lavina have both said. And I think, with respect to um, theaters holding more equitable space, it is about programming, it's about casting, it's about the back office, it's about the audience, it's about the teams, the people making artistic decisions, um, that that has to extend beyond um, the, the maybe the more outward facing um, actions that we take. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that a lot of theaters, I hope are going to be addressing <clears throat> like full stop, as they're coming back, mm -hmm. uh, and, but I'm also sure that there are some theaters who will, um, you know, take a, a much more incremental approach. And my opinion is that, I mean, I feel like the incremental approach, the time for that is a little bit past. And I think there are ways that theaters who are scared of doing this work can still be able to look at who they are and what they do. And I mean, no, no one should be scared of making their spaces more equitable, right? Um, and yet I think a lot of organizations are. So I, I hope to see continued um, calls for accountability, frankly. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I hold myself as, the per as a person who runs a theater, particularly as a white guy who runs a theater, I expect an uh, accountability because I, you know, I, I try to do the right thing at Actors Express, but I know that sometimes I may fall short. And I, I think that we all have a place in this community of holding each other accountable as well as holding ourselves accountable. I love that you said back in. I'm so sorry, Amanda. No, no, you go. <laughs> this is what I dream for, people thriving off conversation. Yeah, I love that Freddie said like the back end, meaning that you're not only inviting people of color into your space to do plays, to show people that we're doing plays of color, but you also have the representation within your organization of people who look like the people who are coming into that organization. Because oftentimes, and I know this as a person of color, when you go into predominantly white spaces, even if I'm a very bold and I think confident person, you know what I mean? But if I'm going into a 
predominantly white space and I'm bringing my work with me and there's only white people, there's going to be an innate insecurity already because I'm bringing this, this sacred piece of work with me to an organization that doesn't even have people who look like me in the organization. So I love that you talk about the back end and not just, you know, the optics of it, but also the commitment to making the spaces equitable and, you know, um, dismantling white supremacy. And the only way you can do that is by diversifying your space and your organization. So, hmm. Freddie, you mentioned, um, um, I can't remember the exact words, but I think people being scared or afraid of wanting to do this work. Could you speak to more about why why someone might be afraid? I haven't heard that thought yet and I find it interesting. Well, it, it's, it's because I think people stick with what they know and people don't like to have their paradigm mm. challenged. And, um, you know, the work that we're doing in our industry of dismantling white supremacy and all that it has gotten its hooks into at every strata of our field over long periods of time it's not always easy work and it's it's easy to say it's going to you know change but there there is there is some work that has to happen and i think that people are afraid of making mistakes i think they're afraid of losing their audiences i think they're afraid that um, the people they perceive as those who are funding the industry, that is to say affluent white people, are going to say, oh, not for me anymore, bye. And and I, and I don't think that that's true or accurate. I think that it means that people aren't always aware of strategies that they can make, uh, that they can employ to make change. Mm. And I'm thinking of some very specific theaters, as I say this, that I will not name out loud. Um, but but I, 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 there are some theaters I'm thinking of right now that I think, yeah, they're going to go back to doing exactly what they did before. And they'll have some fancy words in their plans and they'll say a lot of the right things. They'll have a few more people of color on stage and they'll do ain't misbehaving and they'll call it a day. And yeah. um, it's got to be a, it's got to run deeper than that. If, if I can. I'm in on that because because I uh, you know Sehal Desai who uh, is the artistic director of, of East West Players has taught me so much, um, but but is really the person that like I think sometimes we need to like hear an idea a certain amount of times or in a certain way and like maybe there was something for me about hearing it from a fellow South Asian that he was like look this scarcity mindset is rooted in colonialism right it's it's rooted in in especially uh, pitting people from the global majority or from underrepresented groups you know thinking that like uh, there's only one slot right I get. I, you get more means I get less. And that's just not true. Um, you know, uh, I, I said at the beginning of 2020, I'm working on abundance. And of course, as soon as you say you're working on something, it'll get tested, right? So spoilers, there was a global pandemic. Um, and yet, you know, it, it, it really challenged me to say, okay, well, how can I still find abundance in this? And I think, um, uh, I, I took a negotiation class in my first master's program uh, uh, with a woman named Linda Babcock, who's written a book called um, Women Don't Ask, Negotiation and the Gender Divide. And um, she wrote something that I think about all the time, which is about enlarging the pie and, you know, uh, either or thinking, right? Binary thinking is a characteristic of, of, of white supremacy culture. But, you know, this, again, this idea, I get less, I get, I get more means you get less or vice versa. It's actually not true. There are ways, to, as, as Linda talks about, enlarging the pie in, not that these are negotiations, but as we're, re, you know, revisioning how things work. I, I actually do believe, because as a casting director, and part of the reason I got out of the business is, um, you know, I'm inter I, I basically, I'm a heightened language director. I'm interested in old canon and new canon and um you know particularly when i was i remember there was a particular classical theater that i was working at and i was in a casting conversation and somebody somebody just point blank asked well is it more important that the company is diverse or that the, uh, that the acting company is good and i was like wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute why do we have to choose this is not a binary question and god's bread it makes me mad so for me that's also where some of that comes from that is uh, by the way the most maddening thing i i, I like when i hear that well we just cast the best actor and i'm like well you know what? That is a highly subjective concept, casting the best actor for the role. The need for diverse representation on stage is not subjective. Mm -hmm. So why are they pitted against each other as though one is going to compromise the other? 
Mm-hmm. It, it's crazy. It makes me, it just makes me crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, this kind of segues into the next question then. Who gets the right, and let me say it verbatim, who has the right to tell the stories? Or do stories belong to just one group of people or are they free to be told by anyone? I think the question for me is, is who can, who, why are you telling the story and can you tell the story authentically? Mm. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I'm, I'm a black woman, but I can't write a play about what it's like to be a black man. You know, it, I, not, not authentically, you know, I can, I can tell the story vicariously through my brother or a cousin. Um, and then why are you telling the story? And then if you are telling the story, who are you consulting? If it is a story that is not directly connected to you, who, if you're writing a story about the LGBTQ community or dis- the disabled community, who are you consulting to come in uh, to help you write this story? I also think yeah. for me, it's 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 about, you know, uh, uh, my other master's degree is in arts management. So I like also always have this like audience engagement marketing part of my brain going. And, you know, part of me too is like, well, who's the story for? Who am I in dialogue with? Because especially as somebody who does, you know, old canon, new canon, you know, uh, uh, my buddy Joe Haji runs the Guthrie likes to say that he has a great history of collaborating with dead playwrights and like, same. Um, so for me, it's also, and living playwrights. I also love living playwrights. I also am one. Um, but you know, for me also part of it is like, who am I, who am I in dialogue with? Because for me, that's also part of how do I make the work accessible? I think for me as a director, something I, I often say in the rehearsal room is, is, or in the design meetings is look, the first five to 10 minutes of the play that's where we build the contract with the audience you know that's where we start to teach them how to watch the play and 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 i think also it it begins before that right it's about you know how do you get their ticket and how do you you know enter the space in terms of you know timeline theater is is a company in chicago that does amazing dramaturgical displays um but for me part of that question too is like is is who am i engaging with because i think you know your last question are they free or, or to be told by anyone you know i've i've been wrestling with Um, the South Asian canon lately, mostly because like, I'm just mad that I wasn't, I wasn't taught, I was very, I was taught it in very patriarchal ways as a kid going through Sunday school, Hindu Hindu Sunday school, also a problem, but put a pin in that, right? And then, you know, I I spent eight years in conservatory training and I just didn't get those reflections of self back at me. Um, But something I'm thinking about, you know, when I'm tackling the canon, I'm in rehearsals for an an adaptation of Shukuntala right now, which is like, you know, uh, uh, an ancient Sanskrit play that like I put my own spin on it, but like, South Asian contains multitudes. They see contains multitudes. And like, I am becoming so aware of my like Hindu, North Indian, Sindhi bias. And so part of it too is for me going like, oh, you know, these, these stories that have been told for a very, very long time have also been told in certain ways to certain groups of people. So anyway, that's also something I'm starting to interrogate. Hmm. I, I think a lot about this with respect to queer representation um, particularly given that in recent years there's been growing backlash against, for example, straight actors playing gay roles. And, you know, and I, I don't find the concept of a straight actor playing a gay role as an example to necessarily be offensive. Um, but, I th- and, but I think that what happens is these, um, these questions boil down to binaries. Can, uh, a, a, can a straight person play this role or not? And to... Um, I think it was, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here, uh, but I think what you were saying, India, about authenticity, um, there, there's that question. And often you, I can watch a character and be like, that's not how my story, that's not how the experience is, right? But also for years, particularly if you were from a marginalized group um, and your experiences up to a certain point in history have been defined by people in the quote unquote uh, perceived majority, right? Um, and it, we are at a time, I think, in which stories need to come from within, right? And um, so I, I, think it, I think it's delicate. And, and I love that question of authenticity. I don't know if y'all, are y'all familiar with the, um, Animating democracy, uh, animating democracies, aesthetic perspectives, the eleven, mm-hmm. and it's it's a sort of um, 
system for evaluative language that um, for work that doesn't subscribe necessarily to like Aristotelian principles. And one of the one of the uh, attributes is authenticity. And um, it's something that I think is crucially important, particularly when telling the stories of the marginals. I cannot tell you how, and you probably will not be surprised to hear this. Um, or maybe you will be, I can't, I can't say, but how many plays I've had submitted to the theater since last June about white people and black people working together that have been sent to me by white writers. And I'm like, that it's just, now is not the time for that. Like I, 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 it's, it's, maybe it never was and maybe it never will be but at this exact moment this is not something that i can fathom giving space to um despite what may be very good and honorable intentions on your part i think we also have to make space for people to tell their own stories yeah i think that's interesting because of the history of america and uh how cinema and theater have been uh how they have perceived, and I'm speaking from an African-American's perspective, of how uh, the history of cinema and theater, blackface, minstrel show. So for me, I don't want a white person writing my story. You know, not only because of that history, but because I feel like we have not been able to control the own narratives of our own lives and our own stories. So uh, yeah, and, and Freddie, I'm not surprised because we have people who submit stuff too, and it's like, like, are you serious? You know, or there was one play that was submitted and they, the, the, a white guy wrote a, a black woman character and she was so cliche, you know? And I'm like, this is just not, like, you're not humanizing her. This is not a human. This is, a, you're making this black woman into a sexual object, you know, or uh, a bitch, you know? Like, I'm tired of those tropes. I'm tired of those cliches. You know, so um, I think because of the history that America has with race and cinema and theater, it's really important, you know, for me as a black woman, as a black artist to say, I don't want another racial group, especially a white group, you know, controlling the narrative of my story. Mm. Okay, so this is perfect, actually, to segue into the next question. And this one is a bit of a lengthy one, but it's more so talking about the educational system. And just, um, I believe we all have some form of a master's on this. And so one education in its own way is like a form of gatekeeping, but or um, as in, uh, like getting a master's and a bachelor's, it's a form of gatekeeping. But what about the school system or the structures that we can look at so we can prepare our students or our young minds who are young artists going out into the world to create and one day we'll be taking the places that we're in right now? I love this question. Um, uh, and like I said, I've, I've been uh, uh, spent eight years in conservatory training and I both like, right, it's it's one a huge point of privilege. It's also like um, some, some huge point of trauma. It's complicated, but I, I think Freddie, something you were just saying about like, I've spent my last, um, uh, the last semester teaching script analysis as well. And like the idea of what a well-made play is or what heightened language is, is I think something that really needs to be interrogated because uh, a well-made play doesn't necessarily mean an Aristotelian a structure. I mean, it can be, and I, I absolutely, I made a conscious choice teaching my script analysis class this year that there were, there were, I was like, look, I, I, I know there are certain things I have to teach you. Like I have to teach you backwards and forwards and look, there's still, there's still good stuff in there. But also like, as I'm trying to decolonize my classroom, you know, again, I think this idea of there's only one way to see thing or things are right or wrong. A lot of those uh, either, or it's, it's very rooted in white supremacy culture. And so for me, I, 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 I'm very much struggling with this right now because I feel like, okay, I have to, there are certain things that I feel like I have to teach because if you're going to go out in the world, like I'm, I'm, 
I think we have to like talk about the structure of, I don't know, Hamlet or one of those plays at some point, but I also want to teach that alongside Ike Holter. And I also want to bring in my pal, Louis Douthit from the Play On Festival to talk about like Shakespeare in translation. And I think for me, actually, a lot of it just goes back to what, Freddie, what you were saying about, I think we have to, to re-interrogate what this idea is of good is. Because for me, Amanda, that's part of why I, I, I'm now steering away from that. And like, I prefer the term urgent, right? Do I need to see this story right now? Is there a strong case to be made for it? Um, because for me, actually, like, that's more important than good. But I just, so many of these training programs, like, I get it. Like, I like to say tools, not rules when I teach, because I think ultimately at the end of the day, like, I want people, I, I just love to say, like, your process is your process. I'm not here to prescribe your process because I know what it's like to be in those voice and speech classes where people are trying to colonize my breath. And it just doesn't make sense to me. Mm. I agree. And I, 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 I see it all the time, too, that, you know, a lot of these university departments have faculty who aren't equipped uh, or who just don't know how or in some cases don't care to to decolonize theater training. Um, I, I, I think of, I, I've talked with some other uh, queer artist friends of mine who still talk about the trauma that they endured being made to play straight because from very well-meaning acting teachers who were trying to get them to be more versatile and marketable right um, but why not just exist in the body and in the spirit that you exist in and play those roles uh that that uh speak to that maybe maybe you don't want to play someone with a wife and three kids, or maybe you don't want to play someone from this other group. And, and I'm all for, I'm not meaning to knock versatility, but I think again, it's, it's this lens of, um, you know, white, uh, Eurocentric, uh, heteronormative, um, patriarchy. And I realize those are a lot of buzzwords I just put into one sentence, but they're all very, very, very true. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I, Lavina, I agree with you that this notion of you know, what makes a, a quote unquote good play. I love, I'm going to completely, uh, with apologies in advance, co-opt and, and use your language of urgent versus good. Cause I think that is so, <laughs> such a great like way of mm -hmm. saying something much more meaningful. Um, why, what makes this needed at, the, at, at this time. And, um, yeah, I, I, just, I, I think that we have to get away from, I have no, look, my, one of my favorite playwrights in history is Tennessee Williams. I love Tennessee Williams. Tennessee Williams was a great writer. He wasn't the only great writer, and he's not the only great writer still. And in fact, some of his plays are just downright hard to stomach anymore. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, but yeah, it, we don't need we don't need male orgasmic dramatic structure in every play, um, which is, by the way, not accidental that that's what is defined as proper dramatic structure. Um, and so, yeah, it's just about opening it up and allowing perspectives, aesthetics, points of view, culture, all of that into the mix. Yeah, this is a, a very good question uh, because I work a lot with uh, the urban community, especially when uh, I was younger and me and my brother started our own community. And I have been trained by a guy who trained with Grotowski so I'm into abstract theater and th experimental theater and also like doing theater at the detriment of your health. And you must be at the theater even if you're sick, you know, and I'm diabetic. So I, you know, there were times when I would be very sick and I would still go in and I would just run off stage and like get myself together and run back on. And uh, so I went into the work with that mindset, but I'm working with this community of people who just literally cannot adhere to those restrictions, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, if, and if I wanted to work with this individual group, I had to figure that out, but I was young and I, you know, I learned the hard. Um, but also the idea um, of the structure of a play, I was a teacher. And I started teaching my kids, you know, like Greek tragedy, the structure of Greek tragedy. And then one day this kid got up there and she 
she was 10 years old and she like was explaining to me why we needed to dismantle the structure of this play. And I learned from a 10 year old, like this is actually, this is amazing. And, and, and then I was introduced to Adrian Kennedy, who is notorious for like not having a structure, you know? And I was completely amazed at how effective and powerful her work and how it connected to me, you know, with this different kind of, uh, even though she doesn't have a structure, it's very specific to her, you know, it's her technique. And uh, so I learned a lot from her, but I didn't learn that. In, I didn't learn Adrian Kennedy when I was in college. You know, I learned Stanislavski. I learned all these European white men. Uh, and so that that's one thing that I think we got to really diversify in, in college because it also, um, it alienates African-Americans and not just African-American, but people of color who come from different cultures. You know, because mm -hmm. we can't connect or relate to some of the stuff that you know that's within the, the 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 techniques that you're teaching so that's something that i had to look inside of myself even with doing panther women you know and and, and really like kind of look inside myself and, and decolonize myself you know because yeah. it's like this this is this can't work you got to find another way because this is this is not dismantling white supremacy this is upholding that white supremacy that has been ingrained in all of us, all of us, every American, the world, like white supremacy is just everywhere, you know? So, yeah. Thank India, can I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you first. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, I, I, can I share an anecdote about Adrian Kennedy's work um, that so like was this big light bulb moment for me Please. about structure in particular. I was working with a local um, dramaturg and scholar named Angela Farr Schiller, and we were developing a class for a local playwriting group about how culture informs structure. Mm -hmm. And again, again, to sort of look at ways that are not Aristotelian to um, uh, the, the, the plays uh, can't exist in. And um, so she said, I really want to put Funny House of a Negro into the mix in this class. And I hadn't read it. So I said, okay, great, I'll read it. And so we were at our next planning meeting and she said, what did you think of the plan? I said, oh, it was marvelous. I said, it was so interesting because there were times when I was having to go back and reread it because I would get mm -hmm. lost or confused and not quite sure what I just read. Mm -hmm. And Angela looked at me, she leaned in. I will never forget, we were sitting on the patio at Dancing Goat's Coffee. And she said, um, welcome to my experience every day as a black woman. Yes that I'm always like, did this person just say that? Was this just, and particularly in terms of like how the structure of that play and the aesthetics of that play support and embody that entire experience. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was such a, a, a light bulb moment and it was such a profound moment. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, if you know Angela Far Schiller, she offered many profound moments. She's one of the smartest, most brilliant people I know. Yeah. Um, anyway, you, you mentioned Adrienne Kay, so I was like, I have to throw that anecdote. I it's love like, her. It, it so supports yeah. that, that idea of thinking mm -hmm. expansively. And if you think about it, Freddie, if you go back to the Black Arts Liberation, uh, uh, the Black Arts Movement, if you look at those women that were in that time period, into Jackie Shange, even though she came a little bit after, mm -hmm. she was affected by that, and that is where uh, for color girls came from. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and which informs Panther women, which is, you know, I don't want to compare my work to the goddess of into Jackie Shange, but if I could compare it to anything, it would be that I mean it's poetry, it's song, it's you know, so I mean we might say black women are trendsetters. <laughs> <laughs> um so there's a couple of questions. Um Wait, Lavina, did you want to say something? Did I ever say Oh, you? I just wanted to uplift India what you were saying about um working to decolonize yourself because like that that is something that I've I've just been and like as I've been going back into like I had this light bulb moment with the script analysis class of like, wait a minute, if you believe in Lavina, right? If you believe in restorative, not punitive justice, I don't think I can dock people for late work. And I grew up in a, a in, in a conservatory environment that said if you're if you're late the door will be locked good luck to you you know and 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 so um and and, and Freddie I think you you introduced this earlier when we were talking about you know 
accountability. And I know we're here more to talk about story, but I just, uh, India, what you said about working to decolonize ourselves and just like being accountable to ourselves as as we continue to uh, pursue our anti-racist work is just, a, a, it struck a chord with me and I wanted to approve that, that's all. Well, you're completely right about like, it is um, accountability in a sense does layer into this because it's like, if we're gonna tell this story, have we dealt with everything that's going on or our preconceived notions in order to tell this story um, as best and honestly as we can? So I feel as if your opinion is just as valid. <laughs> um, but there, okay, there are two questions. Um, uh, one person says, as a white cisgender male, how am I to provide a robust opportunity to my high school students in our production slash performance when I am not of a familiar background and yet they're important, there are important stories to tell? Sorry, I'm reading the question. Oh, no, 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 you're all good. I was thinking about, do I need to copy and paste it into... Yeah, I'll copy and paste it just in case it goes away. Well, I think it's about doing the research yourself. Mm -hmm. It's about seeking people in your community who are of different cultures, of different genders, who consider themselves non-binary. Uh, and me, I, I know that the, 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 the we want to dismantle white supremacy, but I also believe that we're going to talk about white supremacy. We don't, we can't just talk about race. You know, we got to talk about people with disabilities. We got to talk about the LGBTQ community. So if you want to diversify your uh, organization, you can't just say we want to just focus on race. You know, that because you can't, I don't believe you can, you know, dismantle white supremacy without uh, addressing all of that. So go into your community, figure out these uh, people who are in that community that identify as that, ask them to come in, have deep conversation with them, um, and, and be real and true. Like, I don't mind talking to, I, I am a queer black woman and I don't mind telling people about myself. I don't, I personally don't think I'm teaching people if I feel that you authentically want to know what I'm saying, you know? And I also think it's important for me as a black queer woman to also go into these communities that are, you know, that, that are cis, white men are the head of and show them that there are different ways and uh, 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 to, to, to look at theater and to look at the world. So I just say seek people out and ask questions. Mm -hmm. Seek people out and ask questions. All right. Chris, uh, and I, then the I, oh, I was just going to pop in. By the way, Chris, I'm glad that you're on this call. It's good to hear from you. Uh, Chris is a frequent um, uh, collaborator at Actors Express. He's a great uh, prop master. Um, uh, you know, I, I ran into this in the classroom in, in the university level, and you know, I've had to sort of like stand back and try to expand my thinking about the kinds of material that um, I provide students to work on. I always encourage students to perform roles, for example, that um, align with their own gender expression or their own pronouns. So I've had I've had students who uh, maybe were female assigned at birth, but who were maybe in the beginning, I think one particular example of someone who was in the very beginning of a transition and came to me and said, may I please play male roles in this class? Well, of course you can. I mean, right? And um, making sure that the material that is made available to students that you know, the, the black students, for example, aren't being expected only to uh, perform material in class that is from white writers, right? And that that there are, I think there are, there are things that you can do to work on decolonizing your space, even if you don't feel completely empowered to, you know, stand in for someone else's experience, right? Um, you are who you are. And the and and uh, and regard depending on what kind of resources you have to bring in people from the outside, you can you know there are steps you can take to decolonize the space and to kind of rethink how the work is made um, inside inside your high school. 
I also, I just want to jump in on that and like, yes, to everything that was just said. And also just to like, I so appreciate this question. And like, um, it sounds to be like, Chris, there's, there's an, um, I appreciate your awareness and it sounds like an impulse perhaps to decenter yourself in the work. And I just want to share that like, so I went to a math and science magnet high school. They do not want to talk about me in the alumni newsletter because here I am. Um, but one of the things that was amazing about that high school, I had like one year of, um, you know, normal high school and then this program, the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy uh, was only sophomore through senior year. And because it was a math and science academy, you know, my first year of high school, I had this sort of very traditional, oh, the, the English teacher, uh, there are two English teachers who run the drama department and they direct most of the plays and like sort of, you know, in terms of hierarchy, the most responsibility one could have as a student would be as a stage manager, as an assistant director. And so like, that was my first experience of high school theater. And then I went to this math and science academy where they're like, yeah, do whatever you want. So I directed, I acted, I designed, I stage managed, I did all the things. And and it was, and then I ended up becoming a theater artist and I maintain that I would not have been if I hadn't gone to that school. And part of it is because, you know, the keys were just turned over to me. And, and, and it wasn't about, again, what is good. It was about this idea of authenticity it was this idea of idea of expression and so i think um oh turn those keys over up in the hierarchy mm -hmm. and then the second question from chris was isn't the idea of objectives tactics obstacles and subtext universal beyond any sort of colonial hierarchy and this one goes back to when we're talking about the structure of the play and how it may not be universal to every culture I struggle with this a lot because the pursuit of objectives is so tied to forward moving dramatic action, which is so tied to Aristotelian dramatic structure. Uh, and how then do you work to make active um, uh, work or characters that may not exist inside those structures? And I, I, I mean, I think that these op, these concepts uh, can be applied to a number of different structures uh, without sort of forcing people into an Aristotelian mindset. Um, but depending on the kind of work, there may be other attributes of the performance that are just as valid or, or essential to the storytelling beyond these particular uh, concepts. Yeah, I think, um, sorry. <laughs> I think what makes these uh, these um, is the words themselves. So for me, it's the language that I use in this space when I'm working with a particular group. So instead of saying, what's your tactic? Try this, do that a different way. You know what I mean? Uh, what are you trying to get here? Are you trying to get something from this person? Because when I first came out of college, you know, I would go into a space that I was working with uh, when I was working with people who had no formal uh, theater education. And I would say, well, what's your objective? What's your tactic? Uh, what's your goal? And they would look at me and go, you know what I mean? And that can be very alienating in a room, you know, where you're working with people who don't have that formal training. So for me, it's just the, the words themselves are alienating mm. you know you just have to find another for me it's finding another way to to talk to uh the group that i'm working with uh yes 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 right and I'm, i mean all about interrogating language and again as as the like you know uh freddie you were talking about tennessee williams earlier you know complicated relationship with shakespeare uh uh colonizer but also pays my mortgage um and you know there are stories that i think are still worth telling in there right but i think you know one of the things that has has really um, become clear to me in studying Shakespeare, but also like, I don't know, just being a millennial is that like the meanings of words change, right? Like natural used to mean fool now, uh, but a contemporary audience doesn't hear it that way. Literally no longer means literally. So like, what are we talking about? So yeah, <laughs> India, exactly what you're talking about, right? I think that my, yeah, and Chris, I see you there in the chat, right? Like my job as a director, I think is to is to build a, a language within the rehearsal room that that makes sense to the people in it. And frankly, because, you know, depending on where I'm working, sometimes the run is longer than the rehearsal process. So for me, it's also about creating a language that that company can continue to use to share and collaborate with each other beyond when I leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've also taken, because I do teach, I teach intro to acting to freshmen and I am tasked with teaching in a way 
that sets them up into their acting two and their acting acting three and that there's a common language in the department and that's one of the expectations placed on um how the department works but i always as i'm as i'm explaining something, particularly if i'm bringing up aristotle if i'm bringing up forward moving action i never mention it without also saying but that's not the only way this there there are other ways to tell this story and because i because i see this comment about understanding the fundamentals and i agree that it, you know you know you're, you're establishing baselines at a certain level but you also have to establish those baselines without limiting people to them is that if mm -hmm. that makes sense um yeah. so it's it's hard but it's um but i think it's important to stop centering the as, as brilliant as he was and as, as much as i still find myself gravitating toward him we have to decenter aristotle <laughs> <laughs> tools not rules <laughs> yep, not tools rules, not rules. Mm -hmm. Other tools out there. Yes. Okay. So kind of gear shifting away, a little bit away from education, somewhat still the same because we have to teach artists what to accept and what not to accept when they get out into the profession and no longer under the educational umbrella. When you say yes to having your work produced as either a playwright or when you say yes to directing a script or when you say yes to about anything that involves you putting your artistry into another person's piece of work, what are some stipulations that you have? And so it's, um, for, uh, for example, India, your show Panther Woman, uh, Women, you say that everybody has to be um, of color. And I believe all of the actresses have to be African American, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So all of the women uh, have to be African American. The director sh it should be African American, and then the production team, women of color. And I I I do that because I I see the piece as more than just a, a play. It's it's a movement too. It's a movement in which uh, I I want to be able to write a piece where more women of color can be uh, employed, you know, and have more opportunities to be on stage. But not only to be on stage, but to tell stories that they can actually identify with. And even although we are in a, although we are monolithic. Um, and you've read this, Amanda, even though this, it's changed many times. Uh, I, 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 this is our third workshop of this. I've been doing it for three years and it's employed over 30 women. And I've sat in the room with all these women and every woman has the same experience, has the same experience. Not that we all come from the same socioeconomic background, but we can still relate to each other. So I don't want to put this piece in the hands of somebody who doesn't understand the words. You know, I want somebody to be able to stand on stage and say these words um, that are sacred to me, you know, and mean it and understand it. Uh, but, you know, other plays that I write, you know, I'm, I'm writing another play right now um, called The Light Post. Uh, I would say that it should be directed by African-American person, you know, but I don't think it, particularly needs to be directed by an African-American woman, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, it's, uh, uh, I want to read your play, um, because uh, it's similar, <laughs> as, as for me as an adapter, like, as, as, as South Asian, you know, I'm the child of immigrants, and, like, a big part of my family values was, like, you know, we, yes, we kick open the door and then we hold it open for the next person. So like, yeah, as, as an adapter, that's something that like, yeah, the South Asian plays should be done by South Asian. And please bear in mind that South Asian or they see contains multitudes. And, you know, when I'm wrestling with Chekhov or, or Dickens, you know, uh, 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 it, I, I, an all white cast is not permitted. I'm just there. Um, and there's there's a note about, about, you know, language. But I think for me, it's more... Um, on the macro level, actually, it's 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 more about, and it, it's more about making sure that my values and the institution va values are in line with each other. And and mm. I think that's something, you know, you were you you began by talking about like what are we looking for coming back? And for me, I think you know one of the things is I'm like, all right, I've heard a lot of talk, and now I would like to see the walk being walked. And if not. I, I'm not sure I want to. I want to work there. And again, for me, that goes back to you know the scarcity mindset and operating from a place of abundance. I've gotten really, really comfortable saying no or saying like, "Hey, show your work," um, because at the end of the day, I think 
you know, again, the, the micro is important as well, but for me, it's ultimately like when I'm looking at, you know, when I'm working at the Guthrie or OSF about like putting together production teams, we're not talking about any specific quotas, but we know that like, we're looking at representation on multiple levels and that that value is important to both of us. So I don't need a number written into my contract. I just need to know that we're on the same page and that I can trust you, which means at this point, you gotta walk the walk. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I agree with that. And there are things that I've turned down um, from organizations that, you know, I don't necessarily um, or, or they don't necessarily embody the values that are important to me. And, um, you know, I, I used to when I was first starting, I remember being the guy who did, literally said yes to everything. Is it paid? Great. Is it not paid? Great. Uh, is it horrible material great is it brilliant material great and i was you know and and i look back on that with sort of like surprise at some of the things i said yes to frankly um in the interest of like you know starting out and now i i recognize i exist in a place of privilege in which i can kind of set a lot of that at my own theater and have a responsibility to do so um and if you if you look at my resume there ain't a lot of freelance work on it um, in the last few years. And so, um, for me, it's also though about like, how are people going to be treated? And that is a big sort of spectrum. Um, I, uh, I think, I think India or, or Levine, I'm not sure one of you were talking earlier about coming from that mindset of like, I think it was you India about you're here, uh, early, you're gone late, you come to the theater, even when you're sick. I once, I uh, was doing a show and the, and the star of the show um, was in bed with a migraine that was keeping her from seeing and causing her to vomit uncontrollably. And the producer made her come to rehearsal and um, which was a useless act. We got nothing done that night and it was horrible and it was ridiculous. And it was, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that you have to like stand up for if you know I, I, and i didn't stand up at the time i, I felt I, was, I felt very disempowered as a freelancer to say anything and again now that i have privilege and now that i can sort of say no to things or stand up and say no that's not how this is going to go um you know i have a responsibility to do that and uh, i i i came from a background I, i've been mistreated quite a few times, quite uh, badly, in fact, by professors or directors or what have you. And, um, and I've seen it in, in, in others and it, there's just no room for it. And, and I've also sort of had to relearn some things like we, as Amanda can attest, we've just made some huge changes to our intern company because the things that I always thought made our intern company great is that it was really rigorous and really strenuous and really hard and it was an endurance test and if you could get through a year of it you were going to have that career in theater and it was going to be a breeze thereafter and you know hearing feedback from former interns saying you know, it was so hard and so strenuous and so exhausting that it almost put me off this career path at all and then it's having the exact reverse uh, impact than was intended and so you know, going, stepping back and saying, I have to relearn some things myself and um, reconfigure things. And um, that, it, it, it's that I think that's important too to, to hold ourselves accountable in the spaces that we go into, as well as the, the companies who are working for holding them accountable. Mm. I, like, this is a, a question that I, I feel as if I should ask every artist how exactly are you going to be holding them accountable so if you are a part of a company for and they and you see something that is not that's not right the down to the basis of terms here that's not right how exactly are you making that stance of i will not be standing for this or tolerate this because i think it shows up differently in every artist or every human actually I appreciate this question because I'm, I'm struggling with it. Uh, and I was just, I was walking and talking about it earlier today because I think that like, and again, India, you're talking about like, how do I decolonize myself? I think that like, 
I am somebody who, look, feedback is my love language. And like, I'm a professional standardized patient. Um, I've, I've been doing that work for over like, which involves giving feedback to medical students on, you know, how they're doing. And so, um, you know, uh, I am a good feedback giver and I am a good um, uh, uh, reporter of things, but I, I am something I am learning and struggling with in terms of myself is, is that I, because of how I was, how I grew up, how I was trained, I have an inherent trust of systems, uh, mm, but that I am also wrestling with, like, that was how I grew up. But then I, as I am learning about like how poisoned the system is with all of the isms, uh, that's just something I'm wrestling with. So like, I don't know, but I feel that tension and this question so hard. I just call it out, man. You know, uh, yeah. that's the call it out and also lead by example. And when, and when I'm in this space with my actors or whoever I'm working with, I want leave space open in a respectful way for us to be able to talk about things that they may feel uncomfortable with, you know, and uh, CPT is also, we set structures where, where we have a task force that we put together where we talk about our cultural values. We have an anti-racist statement, which really isn't a statement. It's more like a, um, it's more like a manifesto. It's like four pages where we talk about, uh, yeah. So I call it out. I mean, Raymond Bobby, who was our artistic director, uh, he, I love our relationship because I feel like I'm allowed to be honest with him and we're allowed, and I'm not afraid to have difficult conversations. And me and Raymond have had so many difficult conversations where I said, that is a microaggression because you can say the same thing that you said to me, to a white person that you say to me, but we can take it differently. And maybe you may not understand that, but I'm letting you know, like you need to, that, that right there is why this person of color said this about this theater because of that. Um, so I just try to call it, I, I'm like the caller outer person here, but I do it with, you know, I do it with respect and um, also with, you know, with determination behind it. Like this can't happen. You know, this is, you know, we have the hard conversations. Um, and then we try to move forward. And, and, I, and like Freddie said in the Venus about taking, a, being able to take accountability you know, saying that I did screw up, you know, but let's figure out how, and I'm gonna screw up again, you know, and I know that sounds crazy, but let's talk about it. And, and, and I'm gonna open up this door and give you room to be able to talk to me about when I screw up. And I appreciate that so much, you know, cause I screw up, you know, we all screw up. It's just being able to, comfortable enough to have that conversation with the person in charge, so. Well, and and those of us who are who are in the position of sort of setting the culture of a space, um, laying out expectations clearly as possible in terms of the kind of space that that it needs to be, but then also offering, and the, and we've done this at Actors Express, and we're initiating it this season with all of our um, production teams and casts. Like, here's also if if something if a mistake gets made or if something that's uh, not good happens, here's how it's going to get dealt with. If you don't feel safe, you know, saying something in the moment, here's who you can talk to. Mm -hmm. and here's how they will deal with it. And, or if you need to be anonymous, here's the person that you go to, or, you know, all sort of different uh, measures so that people know that they don't have to suffer. And I'll, I'll never forget one of my biggest regrets as an artistic director. I used to always have this mindset of, running a small company with limited resources, speaking of scarcity, that if I ruffled the, here I was the person in charge. If I, if I sort of ripple the water, this person's going to quit and we'll be stuck. So I have to just sort of, I was scared to do anything. And a few years ago, an intern came to me after a show had closed and said that a, um, an actor in the show had uh, done something inappropriate backstage and had, had touched a part of her body that she did not invite and that was not welcome. But then she begged me not to say anything to the guy. She said, I just wanted you to be aware, um, but I, I don't want you to say anything because if we run into each other in the industry, elsewhere in the community, it could get awkward. And I've struggled with not having said anything to him for all these years because I essentially enabled his behavior. 
and um, I've since uh, gotten much less um, uh, shy about addressing those kinds of things when they come up. Um, but also it's about trying to do what we can to create the space so that hopefully those things don't come up. And if they do, we know in advance sort of how to do it because there's a system in place. And hopefully that mm. system will work. Yeah, hopefully that system will work. I have the utmost confidence that we will put our entire effort into it. I will say that. That's what I will say. Oh my gosh. Okay. I have one more question. I know it's seven, but I just have this one last question that I want to hear you all's opinions on. Um, so when I was briefing you all earlier on the questions, there was, like I said, this actor who said the sentence to me, I have to see if there's anything in the season for me. And the sense of, I asked them if they were going to be auditioning. And they said, I have to see if there's anything for me. With all the work that theater and people are doing to make spaces more open, inclusive, diverse, equitable, what do you all think of that sentence? Is, do you think with the work that we're doing, it will be eradicated or what? I mean, for me, I hope, I hope so. And for me also part of it, right, that sentence to me connects to some of that educational institutional harm that is done when people tell you, you know, your type is this, or like, this is the type of theater, you know, and, and like, and I certainly, I have felt that as, as a director, right? And, and the thing is though, right? I'm a, I'm a text-based heightened language director and heightened language can look like a lot of things. So yeah, I, I hope that, that there will be something for everyone, but I don't think it's on that I don't, I say to that actor, it's not just on you, right? It's about like communities getting more inclusive in terms of who they're inviting in and how they're going about it. Mm. It's a hard question. I know. You know, uh, I don't know if, if that will happen anytime soon. I think we're headed in the right direction. Uh, Maybe not in our lifetime, but in the maybe next. not in our lifetime. I don't. I hope so, but it's just, you know, like Freddie said earlier. I mean, if you live in, you know, a, a, a white suburban city in Connecticut, you know, and the and the artistic director is afraid to lose their audience, and you're a black woman, and they're, you know, they're doing proof in, you know, these plays that have nothing to do with you, and you're going up against, you know, all these blind hair girls who are perfect for the part you know do you move or it's just too much damage too i don't want to say damage it's just too much ingrained white supremacy and to um undo that that idea so quickly i think we got a lot of work to do that's what i think mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's true. And I think that that statement, though, can also mean different things to different people. Mm -hmm. I think different people have their own boundaries. There may be some people who, to use proof as an example, who might say, that's not a play for me. It's not <laughs> the one that I, you know, and there may be others who would say, yeah, I want to crack at that because I think I can do something with it. And if the, if the theater would consider casting me and if they wouldn't, that's a problem. But like, um, so like, what having something for me in the season means to one artist may be very different than to another artist, depending on their own lived experience or their own way of navigating their work in these structures um, that have persisted and caused so much harm over, over so such a long period of time. Mm. Yeah. All right. Any final thoughts before I close this out? Thank you for having me. It was so great to meet you, Lavina and Freddie. It's always nice to see you. And Amanda, you know I love you, girl. So uh, <laughs> yeah. this has been awesome. Yeah. I love everyone on this conversation. I think y'all are all the best. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Thank you for the conversation and hope to hope to stay in conversation. It was good to see, see some of you and good to meet some of you. Yes. Well, thank you all, one, for saying yes, and two, for just giving your insight and your opinions. They have been lovely to listen to and just respond to. So thank you so much. Thank you to our audience who has been listening, not only today, but for the previous four weeks. It breaks my heart that this is the last one, but I'm also very happy to take what we've learned and put it into the baking process at Actors Express as we move forward. And without further ado, I'll say goodnight.